Our text there is in Jonah chapter 3 and verse 10. When God saw what they did, how they turned from their evil way, God relented of the disaster that he said he would do to them and he did not do it. We're looking this morning at the relieved sign. The relieved sign. This situation which we have here before we enter into the book of Jonah is already a disaster waiting to happen. You know that phrase, don't you? A course of action which is bringing disaster. You could see it, some of you as parents, when you, your children made a decision in life, they were going to go this way in life, and you just knew that's a disaster waiting to happen. You watched them even when they were building bricks as little ones, and you thought, that tower's never going to get up as high as they want, or it's going to fall. It's a disaster waiting to happen. Well, here in Nineveh, it is a disaster waiting to happen. Evil has entered in, they have turned their hearts to seek after what they want and it is a disaster waiting to happen. But there is another disaster that is waiting to happen. God has said he will overthrow this city. It deserves to be overthrown. It deserves the judgment of which it has. Uh, we read it as evil. It is not merely saying they are particularly bad, they are evil. There are many things going on there that we read of in our newspapers and we're glad we don't live in those places or see those things day by day. But they were happening in Nineveh, okay. But yet the miracle of what we have found in this passage is those people turned from that wickedness over these days as Jonah spoke to them of the disaster coming. They sought sackcloth and ashes and they repented. They turned away from the evil they had been doing. When they did that, we find in this passage that we consider it this morning, God relents when Nineveh repents. Now that should stick in your mind okay, shouldn't it? God relents when Nineveh repents. As we look ourselves this morning, we want to find relief from the God who relents. The unchangeable God who relents. That is not a contradiction. That is the same God the unchangeable one. He gives us relief from knowing that he is the God who does indeed relent. The first thing we note here is a specific observation looking at the text. We find the text and this passage telling us something deliberately that God relented of a disaster he said he would do to them. This was a disastrous sight as we find it at the beginning of the book. It is said of this place... Uh, as Jonah is spoken to, arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and call out against this evil, for their evil has come up before me. God had seen it. God had seen the evil they were committing, the things they were doing. Now, the kind of things that were going on there were bringing disaster on themselves. We think of things such as theft, the stealing in one, amidst of one's community, it is only a matter of time before you are caught, but the hurt that it causes in the midst of it. But it was not just theft that was going on. There were all kinds of sins and evils. There was murder. There was all kinds of forms of crime. Nobody thought too much about another man's marriage before committing adultery or about going in and taking what he wanted from their home. The children weren't that special to be treated any differently because of their innocence or, or anything of that nature of society a city which was very much like it, or cities like it, Sodom and Gomorrah, had themselves been full of all kinds of evil. And they were destroying themselves. It was breaking apart. A kingdom that overlooked it. A king who didn't care about it. Well, you do as you please. You're, you want to do that? That's fine. I, I'm not going to stand in the way. It was a, an evil kingdom and it was destroying itself. Nobody felt loved, nobody was cared for, nobody was looked after. The whole place was imploding upon itself and it was already heading for its end. Other kingdoms in the world have done that. In times of their great prosperity and strength, it was a great city. They overwhelmed themselves with great sin. And what armies and kings couldn't do coming against them, they do to themselves, undermining their power and strength. Being so drunk, they cannot fight. Being so crippled by their crime, they cannot manage their own finances and back bankrupt themselves. A disaster waiting to happen. 
In the midst of this, God comes with his degree of his disaster. What you are going to do over a period of time, I'm going to do in 40, day, in 40 days' time. He's going to destroy the city, overthrow it. He is going to change its power. He's going to remove its power and strength and he is going to bring it. And we find there the people respond to this cry. They take God seriously. They realize they are in serious trouble and they repent from their evil. We found it, didn't we? They deliberately chose to mourn over their sin. They put the sackcloth on. They did not eat. They took the fret seriously. They knew that they had done wrong, but they also cried out to God mightily. This was no mere passing. Now we find something interesting. The God who has said he will destroy this city, or overthrow, sorry, this city in 40 days, is the God who here is told in our text to relent. That is not that he repents. He is not like men that he has done some sin here or some evil that he must turn from. But he relents and he does not bring the disaster which he said he would. He looks upon what they have done and he is relents towards them and the disaster is averted. There is something we should note here in this relenting. God relents from a disaster that has no need now to occur. He said he would overthrow the city. He said he would take away its power and strength in that statement. It was considered the whole place would be swept away. He would take away uh, the power that was there over them, the evil. He would remove it. But that is exactly what God has achieved and what God has done. The king and all the people of that city were once bound to the evil of their hands. They were content to see all these things going on in their city, but now they have repented of it and they know that they should not turn again to it. God has no need to destroy their sin for they have turned away from their sin. He has truly overthrown the power of sin over them by peaceful means, declaring the judgment that is to come. And so when God relents of the disaster, he is not changing his mind. He has just accomplished with the means that he has already done what he intended, only greater. For rather than having to sweep men and women and boys and girls into an eternity of lostness, he rather has saved them by the message of this judgment to come. This is how God has relented, why he has relented. But it's not only a specific observation we make here, we look at this passage and go, well, that's fine, but what about other places? And that's why we read in Jeremiah. See, this is in a historical context, this book of Jonah. God deliberately chooses Jonah to leave the land of Israel, travel hundreds of miles, go to a city he doesn't like, to a people he doesn't care for, to share a message with them he isn't particularly keen on, that he may demonstrate to his own people the nature of the God who relents. He said to Jeremiah, this man in this, own, in this land of Israel, arise, go down to the potter's house, and there I will, you will, I will let you hear my words. He took him down into a little potter's house. Now, we've all been there. Most of us did art at school, so we've seen a, a potter's wheel in the classroom, maybe. Or we know what we're looking at here. It would not have had an electric motor, and most of us here remember there was electric motors. Wasn't there? None of us are that old, are we? Not even me on this occasion. We, we know what it is. The wheel is going round, the potter is sitting at it, and he has a lump of clay. In that lump of clay, it is marred. It, it, it doesn't take the shape the potter wants it to take. So instead of giving up on the lump of clay, the potter takes it up again in his hands, he gets it kneaded back into a suitable piece of clay and he begins again to form it into another vessel. With this illustration in mind, God then speaks to Jeremiah and says, now you see this potter, that's how the nation of Israel is in my hands or any other kingdom of the world. Look at the size of the potter, we might think. 
The scale of the pot of the pot, the clay is inanimate, it cannot move or mould itself in comparison with the potter. It is the potter who is the strength and the one who can put his will upon the clay, not the clay, the potter. Even if the pot, the pot is marred, the, the potter has the ability to take the clay again and form it into something else. The, pot, the clay never forms itself here in the illustration. Now he says, if there is a kingdom, and I say that kingdom is going to be destroyed, I say I'm going to bring it to nothing, if it should turn from its way, repent, then I will choose to relent. But if a kingdom who I choose to bless turns to sin, then I will choose, I can choose to destroy. The prerogative of God is not bound by who we are or what we are. It is God alone who can choose what should be done. But God is such a God who will relent. Why does God share this illustration with Jeremiah? Why does he send Jonah to Nineveh? Because his people are behaving badly. They have been on the potter's wheel and God has been forming them into a holy nation, a chosen people, a royal priesthood. He has been making them a peculiar people but they have chosen that they don't like the shape that God is making them into and they will rather choose the evil of this world. And God is demonstrating through what he does with Nineveh that if they would repent of their sin, God would relent of the disaster he's going to bring upon them. Jeremiah had a thankless task, didn't he? Because when he shares this word with the people and he gives the illustration and the definitions which God says, look, if you were re- this nation will repent, I will relent. If this nation turns to evil, then I will destroy. They are so hard-hearted, they simply turn and say, but this is in vain. We will follow our own plans and everyone will act according to the stubbornness of his own heart. But God who will relent when we repent. But they won't do it. And this is God's chosen pattern of behaviour. Why is this to be the case? So, we see the specific, we see the historical, well, let's bring it to the present observation. For we find in God's word, he says this, Have I any pleasure in the death of the wicked, declares the Lord God and not rather that he should turn from his evil way and live. God has no pleasure when a person chooses to live a life of wickedness, of evil, or a life without him, taking him into consideration whatsoever. People who have been blessed, like Israel, Chosen, called, separated. They have been taught the things of God, instructed, brought up in the right way. He has no pleasure when they turn from the things of God and seek to go the wrong way. He does not want to see their destruction. He would rather that they should turn from their evil way and live. Let's bring some practical applications to this this morning. Friends, we live in a world that is heading for disaster. We live in a country presently and you may speak of your own lands where you have come from as well and think of them and you may think of them in the light of what I think of my own land as I stand before you this morning. We are heading for disaster. We have chosen evil. We have made it law that things are acceptable to us which are not acceptable to God. We behave in business and in manner of living as if it does not matter who we hurt to get where we're going. We stamp on the poor. We make the affliction of the low as hard as possible while we let men and women live in the centre of London and cities such as this, bathing in their millions and billions of pounds. We are a country heading for disaster. The evil we have within our land 
will not be cleared by God. We will not smile upon it. If he goes by his character as revealed in his word, because we have done this, for we have turned against the God which every church building demonstrates. Every church of England is shaped in a certain way. Most of the older buildings. They're shaped with you coming in a very small door into a very big opening that you may understand the greatness of the God who is worshipped here. They lead you into, from a nave into a very narrow part that has their, it's a shame to call it an altar, but it's laid out in such a way as to remind us that it is about a death and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ that sins are dealt with. Many of them are laid out in the shape of crosses, reminding of the crucifixion of Christ. These things this nation has known. It has had preachers on every corner. It has had the word of God in every home. It has had the privilege of knowing the things of God, but it has turned to its evil way. It is a disaster waiting to happen. We're beginning to see it already, aren't we? Our families are breaking down. Our, our homes are being impacted by the sins which now are acceptable through our television. We see them proclaimed as ordinary and normal. We have accepted the sight of murder on a daily basis from those who portray things to us. We see adultery as a regular form of, co of conversation as we talk about things such as East Enders or Coronation Street or Emmerdale. We are not shocked anymore when someone is murdered. We have taken the course of evil and we are a disaster waiting to happen. For any kingdom that takes a stand to stand against God, God has said in his word he will bring disaster to it, but that is not where we are here this morning, is it? I trust not. I trust we are not a, a, waiting, a disaster waiting to happen. We've come to church, on the outward exterior we look Christian, but we have plans and plots of things we want to do with our lives outside of God today. If that is the case, then we too as individuals can be a disaster waiting to happen. In this evil and disaster which we are living in, we must take a lesson from the, book, from the life of Lot. In Sodom and Gomorrah, he was there and it was about to be destroyed. He told his sons and, his sons and daughters about, uh, sons-in-laws and daughters about these things and to his sons-in-laws, he seemed to be joking. There are many who think, I am joking. You know, death's coming and we're just going to fall asleep. We will never face this judgment. Well, we're all happy and content. Why are you going to spoil it for those who are making lots of money and, and enjoying the pleasures of these things? Why are you so against those who want to commit an act of adultery and run off with someone else and break up a family? Why are you so against a, a place where we can just avoid our responsibilities to our children? It's my life that's important. Why are you so against? Then we are living with a disaster that no man can stop. God will judge. Because God made this world for himself and he saw that it was good. But the thing that ruined it was your and my choice for evil continually. He's not joking. The word of God is not joking. I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that doesn't mean the wicked don't die. It doesn't mean the wicked don't face hell but he does have pleasure rather in that they should turn from their evil way. He is not joking. Our need is for genuine repentance. I cannot apologize for everything that David Cameron does wrong or any other government minister, but I can certainly cry out to God for my part. Did you vote for these individuals? Then you bear a responsibility. You're part of this nation. You are by identification part of the responsibility. Your life is bound up with the people of this land. You recognize the evil to which it is heading, the disaster which is coming upon it, then your responsibility is to pray. Your prayer is to be one of acceptance of where we are at. We are in a desperate situation heading for disaster with God. 
but it is to be a prayer of genuine repentance as far as we are able to do. Lord, we are sorry for the state of your church in the midst of this nation. A church which accepts homosexuality within its ministers and within its practices. We are sorry for the crimes of not relieving the burdens of the poor in so much of our middle class Christianity. We have many things to bear the burden of repentance for, but one of the primary, we have not spoken the truth to them in love. We've not told them of the disaster they're heading for. We have not cried because somehow we have felt separate and distant. It's them that's heading for disaster and not me. I'm saved. Yeah, but your children, your grandchildren, they may live in the land where God has turned his back upon them. A land like Israel where God had blessed them so mightily but he sent them away into other lands where they spoke another language. For God is not mocked. But my friends, I don't want you to be all doom and gloom this morning. There's enough of that on the news. You know these things are true. My aim is this, that we should recognize we have a God who relents. There is a God in heaven who delights when people turn. There is a God in heaven who delights when people pray. There is a God in heaven who relents of the disaster he has said he would bring upon us. There is hope for this nation. And you are it. That you and I would indeed seek the God who has told us of the disaster that is to come. And we would seek him that he would revive us. That he would move upon our lives. And that he would forgive us for the neglect of our own lives, that we may yet see him move in splendor and power. That when we speak of our politicians, we will speak of them to them of the matters which they have stood against God on, and we will require answers. We will write to our MPs and those who are in power, and we will apologize that we have not addressed them before on these matters, but we do so now, because we are concerned of the disaster that is coming upon them. And we are crying out to God that he will have mercy. And we will also take it our responsibility to pray to this God that he will relent in a way of also turning us more fully to the people we have once been. You read our history, we are no new Israel. We are no new chosen people, but we have been a mightily blessed land. There are a few countries in the world that have as many church buildings present in its history as we do, has had the privilege of the word of God in so many ways, has been used of God to reach so many lands. We have been blessed above many other places. But we are a land heading for disaster unless God relents. What we are looking for is that we believe and know of a God who can turn from the disaster he has promised and make us into a people again, in which he delights and is pleased. And he can use us. Some of you come from lands you wish that God would relent of the disaster that is coming upon them. We have a God who relents. He does not repent. He is not sorry for making us feel the weight of our sin or the disaster that is coming upon us. He does not need to apologize to us that he has frightened us so. He does it in order that we may turn that he may have pleasure and live. We, he may, we may live. So as we leave here this morning, I know it's a weighty subject, but are you leaving relieved or alive? Now, before you question my English, there is this about it. My friends, it is wonderful to know of a God who relents. That is a relief. That is a relief. Yes, we have a God who does not change, but we have a God who does relent. That is a relief because that gives us hope. That gives us hope and expectation. That gives us the desire that we may move on in prayer and desire and work towards the Lord would indeed relent and turn again towards us. That's, that's a great thing. Also, it is good for us to know of being relieved that we have a God who has turned from our sin and turn from our evil and, and loves us. 
Because each of us was under a condemnation without God, we were going for a lost eternity. But by trusting in the Lord Jesus Christ as Saviour who died in our place, we become those who are relieved. God has turned from the disaster he said he would do to us. But it is also possible to go from here relieved. There are many people in this world, they believe in a God who relents. They believe they will come to face God on the last day. They will die and they will come to his judgment. But they believe that God then will look at them and he'll say, I'm not really going to do what I said. I won't really put you in hell. That God does not exist. It is inconsistent with his word and that is no relief at all. It is a relief. It has a lie at the centre of it. If you are believing that you can live your life just as you please and you do not need Jesus Christ as Saviour and Lord, you do not need to accept what he as Lord desires for your life and how you should live and turn from your evil, then you are living a lie. And there is no relief in it. It is a relief. The need here this morning is to be clear. God can only relent when we repent. He can only relent when we repent. That repenting comes through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. The one who he turned on instead of you and me. The one who he put all his anger upon instead of you. And he bore away all our sins and all of that in his body. The reason God can look at you and smile and the God can look at you and give you peace and joy because he has put all the punishment of your sin on Christ. That is why we leave relieved. Leave relieved. But to trust anything else is to live a lie. I praise God that he sees our ways and he relents of the disaster he said he would do to us. May God have mercy upon our nation too in light of these things.